Thank you, Charlie. Reading that passage of scripture. I have here a whole stack of cards, visitors. I think you make up half of, if not more, of the assembly today. Our good friends Ed and Susie Planis are here. What a pleasant surprise. Actually, I can almost say half the Woodward Park congregation's here. Did you all know you were going to find each other here? Isn't that a pleasant thought, Lauren? We've been looking for Susie and Ed for a while now. <laughs> now you know where they were, Lauren. <laughs> Okay, Brett and Shannon Watkins, raise your hand, there you are. Steve and Heidi Stoll, good to see you folks again. Hilda, it's not Heidi. As soon as I saw you, I knew it wasn't Heidi, I'm sorry. I know who you are, both of you. Steve and Michelle Knudsen from Clovis. Nice to see you folks again. And of course, Lauren and Christy over here. It's nice to have you folks. Now, on the west side, that's on the east side, West Side Church Christ, Jim and Maggie Hayes, where are you? And Lyndall and Drew, Lynn, nice to see you folks from West Side. Howard and Joyce Chanel, good to see you folks. And Larry Jen Marshall. All right, isn't that funny? They're on the wrong side. <laughs> so pleasant to have you, uh, you folks with us. As you know, I went through an episode, if you might want to call it that, uh, that could have been a life or death situation. And of course, I did not know that I was in that kind of a condition since I prided myself in being very physically fit and uh, prided myself to probably be fitter than most 71-year-old men. And, uh, and yet, um, just like the um, biggest loser trainer who had a major heart attack and his body was, looked like it could have been chiseled in stone, uh, that, of course, was a great uh, deceptive uh, thing for him. And he didn't take into consideration that little word, genetic background. And the same with me. I have uh, a family history of heart disease. So physical activity and physical fitness is not all that it takes to try to keep your arteries all clean. And so it was a, definitely a, a wake-up call for me uh, to realize that uh, I have to really change my lifestyle as far as diet is concerned. Uh, I didn't think it was that bad, but obviously... I need to uh, do some real serious thinking about that. I've given a lot of serious thinking to what lessons do you learn when you have a brush with death? Eleven years ago, it happened to me before, and I was much closer to having a fatal heart attack at that time than I did this time. Nevertheless, it's quite interesting that the symptoms that I had were not unusual for people having the symptom every day. It's just an achy arm and nothing more and no real pain whatsoever. Uh, but when you, when you go through these things, you become a little more sober-minded about life and you start thinking some serious questions like, God, are you trying to get my attention? Have you shot some warning shots and tried to jar me to a sense of awareness that maybe there are some things that need to be changed in my life that need to be changed? It's so easy to pride ourselves in being godly servants of uh, 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 and, and just overlook some of the things that we come to accept in our lives as being human. And yet, maybe it's just a big rationalization, a big lie, and that there are things that still cling to the flesh that need to be removed. 
and that we need to wake up and realize that we cannot pride ourselves in what we're doing and serving the Lord, but that it's the inner heart that we have to look at and ask ourselves, maybe, just maybe, we need to look closer in the mirror and ask ourselves what needs to be fixed. You heard this passage read, Hebrews 12, 5 through 12. And from what I see, I have about 15 minutes. I don't know how I'm going to get through this in 15 minutes, but I will try. You know, the thing is, the scriptures never seek to justify God for the evil that is in the world. And the closest thing for a theodicy is the record of the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Now, that word is new to you. The word theodicy was coined in 1797 to refer to what I define as a defense of God's goodness in view of the evil in the world. In other words, the first thing that happens many times when a person is struck with some major illness is, Why me, Lord? I'm a good person. I don't understand why this happened to me. And if you're all powerful and all good, why did you allow such evil to happen to me? How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you really have thought that at one time or another? Maybe when you're very young, you don't have any uh, life or death moments in, uh, to, to refer to, but maybe you have. But sooner or later, when you're challenged to face this, you wonder, why me? And then you start trying to come up with answers. That is an effort to come up with what is called a theodicy. Now add that to your vocabulary because that's a very important word. It's a defense of God for the evil that is in the world. And of course, this is an inadequate definition because it doesn't say exactly what kind of God we believe in. But the biblical view of God is that he is all powerful and that big, big word omnipotent comes in here, that he's all powerful and capable of doing anything that he wants or what he's, what's capable of being done. And even more, when you think about it deeper than that. And that God is an all good God. So, if he's all powerful and he can prevent evil and yet he doesn't, doesn't that reflect upon his goodness? And if he wants to remove the evil, but he can't, that reflects upon his almighty power that he claims to have. So the perplexity continues on throughout history. Theologians and philosophers have kicked this around ever since the second century as far as Christianity is concerned, even farther back in Greek philosophy. But I'm not a philosopher. I'm just a simple preacher. And it really comes down to try to figure out what is the Lord trying to tell us. Now, if you're interested in the philosophical explanation from a biblical point of view, I would suggest the book, God, Freedom, and Evil, by Christian philosopher and theologian Alvin Plantinka. And, um, but you better like logic to go there, okay? Now, if that's your thing, read that book. And you'll have a good explanation of the biblical point of view of justifying our God, a theodicy that says that God is all powerful and all good and the evil does not reflect upon his goodness nor his power. Now, since I'm a preacher, I basically want a biblical theodicy and that is found in Genesis chapter 3. And the Christian defends God by saying that God so happened to create us with free will. That tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the center of that garden is a testimony of God's gift of free will to humanity. Now, when God established free will in humanity, that was a great risk for God. Because he also knew that that could introduce 
evil in the world. And guess what? It did. And we have what is called the fall, which according to Romans 8, not only brought mortality into the world, but also brought a curse of the universe that can bring about mortality. So the mortality of human beings necessitates a fallen world or universe that leads to the judgment of death as far as God is concerned in Hebrews 9 and verse 27 where it's appointed to man to die and after that the judgment. And so the Christian who believes in a perfect God must accept many unanswered questions by faith. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, but those that he has revealed belong to his children. And so we've got to accept things as we find them. We find a fallen world. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 11, time and chance overcome us all. There is the element of chance that we live to face. And so ultimately, if we choose to drive 100 miles an hour down the highway, the chances are we may kill ourselves or others. Time and chance happens to us all. We place ourselves in circumstances that are more dangerous than other circumstances. And so the risk factor increases exponentially based upon what we're doing. And so we accept those things. In 1 Corinthians 15, 21, 22, we find that through the fall of Adam, it brought mortality upon us all. That doesn't mean that we can live 70, 80, 90 years and then die. It just simply means that we can live until time and chance overcomes us all. Now, if it behooves God's will to intervene and extend our lives like he did Hezekiah, wonderful. But he doesn't do that every day. He doesn't do that for every person. That's a unique thing. We have a distorted uh, picture of, I think, the Bible. And assuming that it's just filled with miracles. There are miracles, yes, in the Old Testament. There are miracles, yes, in the New Testament. But if you take all the history that is recorded in the Old Testament all the way to 400 B.C., and you pick out the miracles, and you will discover that that time element only reflect a few miracles, and the majority of those godly people in the Old Testament never, ever saw a miracle just like you and me. And so it was very unique, and most of those people, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, live life just like you and me, going through life with time and chance. And we have to accept the reality of a fallen world and consequences of free will. Now, having said that, as a sovereign God, nothing takes him by surprise. Isaiah 46 and verse 10 says, He declares the end from the beginning. Now that's too wondrous for me to even comprehend how that God can know the end from the beginning without decreeing every little thing to happen. And yet the Bible says He does. It just goes to show us that there are many things we don't understand about God based upon our little logic that we have in what we call a brain. But God knew beforehand what man would do with free will. And he planned ahead of time what to do about it once man fell. And he would provide mankind with a means of escaping the consequences of his abusing free will. And so he sent this God-man called Jesus to die upon the cross to reverse the curse of the fall. And ultimately, we will escape the curse of the fall if we embrace that gift and serve him faithfully according to his will and according to our abilities. Now, God knows 
that our natural habitat in this world is hostile to us. And as mortals, we will die. He also knows how sin has so mastered our lives that it's going to take some extra work on his part to free us from the shackles and the powers of sin. And so he has made it possible for us to do that through what I might call, Luther, Martin Luther called, means of grace. That he has instituted the word of God as a means of grace. That if we uh, allow the word of God to dwell in us, we will not sin. If we associate with other Christians and through the power of Christian association, through worship, we will be empowered to live better lives. The Holy Spirit dwelling within us, helping our infirmities, Romans 8. There are a lot of means of grace by which he has put into motion in order to deliver us from the shackles of our mortal weakness of the inner nature. Now, one of the things he uses, according to Hebrews chapter 12, is evil. The evil that is in this world, God can use for our benefit. Now, for some, that's incomprehensible. But let's ask the question, wouldn't it be strange of an all-powerful God who allows bad choices by his creatures handcuff himself so that he would not be allowed to help those whom he loves? So why, would he, why wouldn't he also be able to even use the bad things in this world to accomplish his ends, which is to deliver us from the power of sin? And so he, he does do that. And so, as Rusty Bolton wrote in his book, uh, it depends on how you look at it, God wants us to look at the tragedies of life, the difficulties, the challenges in our life in a different light. Whereas the people of the world says, you know, just bad luck. We had some bad luck. Why can't the Christian say, now God didn't cause this, but it happened nevertheless. And now is an opportunity to work with God with these matters. And I'll be able to use this as a means of disciplining myself so that I can be more like God. Hebrews chapter 12, that's what it says. Now, isn't it true that our parents, and the Hebrews author says this, our parents disciplined us for our own good, right? Now, they weren't perfect. Sometimes maybe the discipline was disproportionate to the provocation. We know that. How many times I said, I didn't deserve that. My brother deserved it, not me. And so we feel that we were punished unfairly. But they did the best they could, right? And... While we suffered that punishment, we didn't see any good that could come from it, but yet the punishment from our parents was for the good that could come from it and developing character and helping us to mature and make the right choices. And so the Hebrews author says, our hardships haven't killed us. They can, and if they do, we're in the presence of the Lord. Meanwhile, if it doesn't kill us, as Nietzsche, the German philosopher, said that what doesn't kill you makes you what? Stronger. Now, I don't know if that's true in every case, but there's a general principle there that applies to looking upon our troubles as discipline for good or that we might partake of the holiness, the righteousness of God and have righteousness and peace in the end. And so the discipline enters into this equation when we look upon our troubles. And what did I learn? Well, you know, it is true that sometimes a person must be flat on his back before he looks up to God. 
in Isaiah, pardon me, Psalm 119, I don't remember, 107, or in that area, it says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I observe his commandments. Hmm. Similar thought, isn't it? Now, sometimes it takes the hardships of life for us to wake up and realize that we're mortal. And that we're not going to be guaranteed a tomorrow. And as a matter of fact, there are a lot of people who are dead right now because they were not as vigilant as I was 11 years ago and just two weeks ago. Because, oh, that's not a major pain in your chest, so just ignore it. Well, we can ignore a lot of things in life and fail to realize that we are not getting closer to God. And so the question is not, God, did you cause this to happen? God, did you make this happen? No, time and chance overcomes us all. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11. Don't forget that verse. And so the problem is that we fail to realize that, that time and chance will happen to us. And when it does happen, what is our mindset? How do we look at that? And how we look at it makes the difference possibly between heaven and hell. That's one of those life and death statements. <clears throat> <coughs> And so when God allows, through his will, things to happen to us, we must look upon these as an opportunity, number one, to reflect, what have, how, what have I been doing that is wrong? You punish the child, and you send him to his room, and you do whatever you do, and hopefully not uh, abuse the child. And I don't think Christians with the Spirit of Christ would. But whatever discipline you use, that child is given that time out or that discipline to really think about what he did, right? Now, I want you to think about what you did, right? Okay, time for reflection. God wants us to reflect. What have I been doing that's not right? What have I been doing? That has kept me from growing spiritually and becoming what God wants me to become. Or, on the reverse side of that coin, what haven't I been doing that's right? Perhaps I need to reflect upon the things that I need to be doing. Not only upon the things that I have been doing. Maybe I've been guilty of the sin of omission. James chapter 4, the last verse in that chapter, 17 is it? To the one who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So there are some vital lessons here that we, may t we must take into consideration. And we got to understand that our problems, our difficulties, isn't necessarily sent by God, it could have been sent by Satan. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it was Satan who buffeted Paul's body. In the book of Job, it was Satan that afflicted Job. <clears throat> There's a difference between the decree of God and the um, permissive will of God. The permissive will of God is that he'll allow you to sin if you so choose. He allows things to happen in their natural courses of things. The chances of life fall under the permissive will of God. Now you think about it, when you come back to this question, why me, Lord? Think about this. If he delivered every believer out of every horrible circumstance, wouldn't people become believers for the wrong reasons? They would use God as a, as a parachute in life to escape from all the problems of the world, but that wouldn't make them closer to God in holiness and purity, would it? People would become Christians for the wrong reason. And plus, we live in a fallen world. It's appointed to man to die uh, once, 
Something's got to take us, right? Sooner or later, God has to take his sustaining grace away and allow us to die. But we die from something. And so we've got to understand that meanwhile, not knowing that time that we're appointed to die, that we've got to use the time wisely and we need to count it all joy, my beloved brethren, when you fall in manifold trials, knowing that this will prove your faith. James chapter 1, 1 through 3. So, the outcome of discipline, says Hebrews chapter 12, is to produce a harvest of righteousness and peace. That's what God wants from us in our attitude towards our suffering is it producing resentment cynicism disbelief doubt anger or is it producing a harvest of righteousness and peace again it depends upon how we look at our troubles righteousness refers to that right treatment of others and a right standing with our God. And the harvest is also that of peace. There is no greater peace than the peace that a Christian receives from God. In Romans 5, in verse 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Peace. Peace with ourselves not carrying that monkey around on our back, not carrying that guilt for unrepented sin. Peace with others, not harboring resentment and hatred and vengeance for others who have wronged us, letting it go. This is what discipline will do for our lives, and that discipline refers to the hardships that we suffer in life. And then ultimately the peace that comes that passes understanding, and that is the peace with our God. No, evil is not the same thing as good. Suffering is not the same thing as good. All the Horrible things in this world are not redefined as good, but God can use them for good. In Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. Now let's look at the all things. He didn't say all the good things, but all things that accompany encompass everything. God is so powerful that he is not handicapped when it comes to dealing with man's sin, the tragedies and the curses of life, and the fall of the world. Ultimately, he is victorious, but we have to work with him. We have to work with our God. We have to change the way we look at things. Not blame him, but accept what is and take it and run with it and become what God wants us and produce the harvest of righteousness and peace. The lesson is yours. We hope it has been beneficial. It's benefited me in studying and preparing it for you. And we need to obviously look at things a little different than the people of the world so that we might benefit from God loving us. For those whom he loves, he disciplines. If you're not a child of God, it's unfortunate because God is not working through all these things in your life. Only for his children are they blessed with the fact that God will work all things for good for those only that love him. If you're not a Christian, you have no promise. You are lonely in this world. God is not going to answer your prayers. He may be merciful, but don't ask him to forgive your sins unless you accept his terms of pardon instead of making your own. 
here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Said the Ethiopian. Only one thing that hindered him. He needed to confess that Jesus was the Lord, the Christ, the Son of the living God. That means owning him as your Lord and Master and serving him the rest of your days. Are you willing to do that? If you've not been living a faithful Christian life, I hope this lesson is sunk deep and within your heart and you realize what you need to do to make things right with God. It's your invitation from the Lord. Please come as together we stand and as we sing.